further ado, I'm going to welcome Doug and thank you again for making the trek here all the way from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Janie. That, that was very good. Do you want to give my talk? Yeah. And we could talk about the nature of oaks or we could talk about the, the sightings I've seen the three ivory bill woodpeckers that were sitting right next to the harpy eagle. Did you hear about those? <laughs> All right, we'll talk about nature of oaks. Can we lower the lights a little bit here? There we go. Uh, nature of oaks, everybody thinks I'm an oak expert. I'm really, I've been looking at the things that depend on oaks. I learned a little bit about oaks. You know, the best way to learn about something is to write a book about it, and then everybody will tell you what you, you got wrong or what you <laughs> left out. Then you really know about it. But um, we'll just start out with, with something you all do know, and that is that insects are the little things that run the world. You know that. E.O. Wilson told us that way back in 1987. But we got a big problem today, and that is that we're losing our insects. We've already lost more than 45% of those little things that run the world. And that's because the way we live our lives kills insects. Lights kill insects. Neonicotinoids kill insects, and all the light green there is where we have our crops. That's where we're using neonics. Deforestation kills insects. Cars kill insects. Climate change kills insects. When you take an area like this and you turn it into that, it kills insects. What does this have to do with oaks? Well, there's no better way to share our spaces with nature, with insects, the insects that, that run the world, than to plant oaks. And I'm going to tell you why that is today. I'm going to start with the oaks that I planted at our house when we moved in uh, to uh, this, this little plot of land on, in Oxford, Pennsylvania in the year 2000. It was part of a farm that was broken up into 10 acre lots. It had been mowed for hay before we moved in, but taken out of mowing three, uh, three years before we actually moved in. And when you mow for hay in Southeast Pennsylvania, you're really mowing the rootstocks of all the invasive plants. And it doesn't matter, you can call it hay because they just chop it all up and give it to the mushroom industry. So when they stop mowing, that's what comes back. And that's what the property looked like. All 10 acres of it. And there's my wife, Cindy, getting rid of that, all of that stuff. It's, you know, Oriole and Bittersweet and Japanese Honeysuckle and Bush Honeysuckle and Multiflora Rose and Autumn Olive and on and on and on. So 10 solid acres. You can't talk about restoration until you get rid of that. And if you have a problem with invasive species, don't give up. If Cindy can get rid of it, you can get rid of it. <laughs> um, so. We moved in in July, and that fall, uh, white oaks down the street, about a mile and a half away, dropped some acorns. So we wanted to start our restoration right away. So I, I gathered up some of those acorns, and I stuck them in the ground. And of course, members of the white oak group germinate in the fall. And that's all they do is they put down a root, a radical, and then they just sit there. And then in the spring, they put up their first pair of leaves. And that's pretty much all they do then, too. Um, and this gives people the impression that oaks grow very slowly. Uh, but they're not, they're not growing slowly, they're just growing beneath the ground. Um, the first year of growth, oaks put on 10 times more root biomass than above ground biomass. So they're, they're growing, they're laying out a big root system that is going to support their rapid growth later on in life. Um, so that's the oak we're gonna follow. It's got a little deer cage around it. If you don't put a cage around your young oaks these days, you don't have a young oak. And that's what it looked like 18 years later. 45 feet tall, 47 inch circumference, a canopy spread of 30 feet. Still a baby, of course, but it's a real landscape tree and it didn't take that long. Oh my. That's not what that slide's supposed to look like. <laughs> All right. Well, what's one of the points that I want to make today is that oaks really are a, a lifeline uh, to an, an awful lot of species. Dozens of species of birds depend on, on oaks. Uh, a number of, of mammals as well, including the big guys. Bears, the large oaks that used to be in our forest often have hollow centers. That's where bears would spend the winter. But raccoons and possums, uh, uh, depending on oaks uh, during the winter time, particularly the eating a lot of, of acorns. Not that many uh, reptiles depend on oaks, but there are several species of butterflies that are specialists on oaks. Hundreds of species of moths uh, depend on oaks, as well as their predators and their parasitoids. Lots of cynipid gall wasps, they're specialists on oaks. Then we have a lot of beetles, June beetles, longhorn beetles, metallic wood boring beetles, weevils, and all kinds of things that are associated with the leaf litter underneath the oak. So the point I want to make is that there's a really 
diverse community of life that's associated with oaks. And the problem is people don't know it. It goes unnoticed, and if it goes unnoticed, it goes unappreciated. And that's exactly why I wrote the book. Um, it's a month-by-month -month guide to all of that life that occurs on your oaks. And the goal was to provide the knowledge with hopes that it generates interest. And interest often leads to compassion. And we need a lot more compassion towards the natural world these days. So first, a few facts. The genus Quercus uh, is a large one, contains 91 species in North America, 435 species globally. There are 200 species of oaks in Mexico alone. Uh, Quercus comes from the Celtic quer, meaning fine, and quez meaning tree. Then oaks are indeed fine trees. There are four major taxonomic sections uh, in, in uh, this genus, and we hear about them, so we'll talk about them. The white oak group is called the Quercus group. The red oak group is Lobati. The live oak group, Varentes, and a much smaller canyon oak group, Protobalanus in the west. That's the distribution of oaks. They occur every place except the brown areas. There's at least one species of oak. So the brown, the high plains, and then the, uh, the, the um, coniferous Rockies um, don't have any oaks. But the center of distribution is the southeast here, uh, although uh, California has 38 species of, of oaks. So they're, they're almost all over the place, and they live a lot longer than people think. Average lifespan of an oak is 900 years. I hear all the time, I've got a 100-year oak. It's a baby. 300 years of growth, 300 years of stasis, and 300 years of decline. And during each one of those, those um, periods, they're delivering unique ecosystem services. And we'll talk about why most of our oaks actually don't live that long, because there's things that we do to them. Um, how, what is the oldest oak in the country? People argue about it, but it could be the Pachenka oak in uh, coastal live oak in California. It is estimated to be 2,000 years old. But if you really want the oldest oaks, uh, look to the Palmer oaks, also in California. They are low growing, almost look like a ground cover. They'll root in one place and then they'll grow slowly over here, root over here, this part will die and then they keep rooting. Uh, that specimen's been estimated to be 13,000 years old. So these low growing oaks are some of the oldest things on the planet. They can get big. This was the Y oak in Y, Maryland. It was the biggest white oak in the country. I did get to see it before it blew over in a hurricane. Uh, almost 20 years ago now. Uh, and, but you know, people think all oaks are massive and therefore they can't plant them in their, their yards. But actually we do have some small oaks and we'll talk about that as well. So oaks have superior ecological function. It's another theme uh, for this, this talk. And I'm sorry about the, the small letters. It wasn't small when I sent it. So, um, What do I say? They have superior ecological function because they're supporting the most species. So the highest biodiversity value. They're sequestering more carbon dioxide than almost all the other trees, pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, out of harm's way, uh, building their tissues out of that carbon, and then they pump the extra carbon into the soil through their root systems. Uh, they are the best soil stabilizers when they have those huge root systems. They make the best leaf litter, meaning it lasts the longest. And when we talk about what leaf litter does, uh, that becomes important. A single oak leaf can take up to three years to break down much longer than uh, most other types of leaves. And all of that promotes healthier watersheds. So I started the book in October. And people always say, why'd you start in October? Because that's when my wife, Cindy, said, you should write a book about oaks. <laughs> and it was October, and I looked out the window, and there's our oak. And of course, October is, is uh, the month of acorns. It actually starts in September. But, and acorns are one of the, the most noticeable feature of oaks. Everybody knows what an acorn is. Uh, and oaks make a lot of acorns, and a single Lifetime, they can produce up to 3 million acorns. Each acorn is a very rich packet of food. It's very rich in fats and protein, and a lot of animals depend on acorns. Uh, again, a lot of rodents uh, depend on acorns when they fall, but the big guys do as well. Black bears are scouring the, the woods in the fall, eating as many acorns as they can to put on a layer of fat to help them get through the winter time. Uh, raccoons eat, eat uh, acorns, possums eat acorns. Uh, of course, our squirrels do, and those, those cute deer, they eat acorns too. Many birds, uh, turkeys are doing the same thing. They're scouring the woods, eating as many acorns as they can, so they can put on layers of fat that will get them through the winter time. Uh, red belly woodpeckers, titmice, towhees, uh, uh, nuthatches, 
you know, I read that nuthatches like acorns. But I put putting out acorns, trying to get a picture of a nuthatch taking an acorn, and they won't touch it. So I, you can, we'll put a question mark on that one. But uh, flickers, lots of things depend on acorns, particularly ducks, particularly wood ducks. Any acorn, any viable acorn that falls into the water sinks. But the wood ducks will s swim down and get it out off the bottom, or they'll come right up on the shore and eat acorns all day long. There are a number of invertebrates that depend on acorns as well. This is an acorn weevil tunneling out of an acorn after it's finished growing. That's what the adult looks like. They can be really common in acorns. And a uh, group of, of insects called acorn moths, it's a species complex. They all look like that, but there's a number of species and you need DNA to actually separate them. Uh, so this is a group where the caterpillar develops inside oaks and then they tunnel out just like those acorn weevils. So all these things are eating acorns. And if you look under an oak tree, you know, two weeks after the acorns fall, it's utter destruction. Uh, there are no viable acorns there. They've either been eaten or crushed or carried away. And you might wonder how oaks ever successfully reproduce. And this is where a very ancient mutualism comes to the rescue. It's a mutualism between oaks and jays, all kinds of jays. Um, they, uh, they like each other. They got to know each other because they evolved pretty much at the same time in the Arctic about 50, uh, 56 million years ago in at least what is now the Arctic. Uh, and that, that mutualism developed right away. The oaks produce the acorns that the jays depend on for winter food, but uh, jays allow oaks, or, or um, well, they don't allow, they actually move oaks farther and faster than any other tree genus in the world. And this is how that works. Jays store acorns for winter food. So uh, they don't cache them. They're not, not making a big pile of them in one place the way many squirrels do, but they bury them singly. They can carry more than one acorn at a time, but they will bury them singly. So they'll pick up an acorn, they'll fly up to a mile, although I read the other day, a mile and a half. It's a long distance from the parent tree uh, before they actually settle down and bury that acorn. They'll find a disturbed area and tap the acorn beneath the soil surface. Now, if they think another jay has watched them do that, They'll wait a few minutes and then they'll dig it up and move it because jays know that jays steal acorns. <laughs> and then, of course, during the winter time, they're going to go back and, and uh, have something to eat. Well, they work very hard in the fall. A single jay can bury up to 4,500 acorns. But here's the key they only remember where one out of every four <laughs> acorns is, which means a single jay can actually plant 3,360 oak trees each year. It's not just blue jays. All the jay lineages do this. This is the scrub jay in, in Oregon uh, moving acorns. Another bird that has a good relationship, very specialized relationship with acorns would be the acorn woodpecker in the southwest. Very beautiful bird. Um, they're, they're doing the same thing in a different way. They're storing acorns in the wintertime for, for use, but they don't store them below ground. They find a, a dead tree, a snag, and they carve out little acorn holders and they stick the acorn in the acorn holder uh, and it'll spend the winter there and then they, they uh, get it when they're hungry. Uh, so we call those acorn trees <laughs> and a single acorn tree becomes a really valuable resource. It can hold up to 50,000 acorns. So uh, acorn woodpeckers are social. The family unit will guard these trees. They don't want any other acorn woodpecker to use this valuable resource. So there's a lot of interactions that, that happen when another woodpecker comes along. If you end up actually having an acorn woodpecker tree in your yard, it's really entertaining. <laughs> okay, November is when you might look back and say, well, there were a lot of acorns this year, or there were hardly any. Oaks don't do too much in between. It's all or nothing. And when it's all, it's called a mast year. Uh, and they can drop a lot of acorns. Uh, and when they're not making a lot of acorns, it really is almost nothing. So that's an unusual, unusual way for plants to, uh, to reproduce, which means ecologists want to explain it. Why mast? Why not produce pretty much the same number every year? And there are four major hypotheses, predator satiation, predator reduction, improved pollination, and energy partitioning. So we'll look at each one of those, and they are not mutually exclusive. They all could be selecting for masting at the same time. Okay, predator satiation, that's an acorn weevil outside of the acorn, and as I said, they can be really common. Up to 90% of the acorns on a tree can have an acorn weevil uh, in it. Now, if, if Oaks made the same number of acorns every year. 
the population of acorn weevils, the population of acorn moths, the squirrels and the deer, all of those things that depend on acorns in the fall would stabilize around that number and they'd eat just about all of the acorns and the oak wouldn't be able to reproduce. But if they have a mast year and they make a whole bunch of acorns, then those populations build up. You get a lot of squirrels and a lot of acorn weevils and a lot of acorn moths. And then the next year, there's almost no acorns. Then those populations crash. Uh, you really do have mass starvation, but it reduces the, the acorn predator populations. And typically oaks go several years between mass. So the populations stay low and then you have another mass year and it overwhelms the, the population of weevils and, and uh, so on. Okay, improved pollination. Oaks are wind pollinated, which is a game of chance. They simply, they've got male catkins here and they, they uh, release their pollen on the wind and it floats around trying to find female flowers. Those are female flowers, those little teeny inconspicuous uh, red things up there. But on a single oak tree, the females don't mature at the same time that the uh, pollen matures. So the pollen is released when the female flowers are not yet ready to receive it, which means a single oak tree cannot fertilize itself. So when you have a bunch of oaks in an area releasing their pollen all uh, in, for example, the same week, the chances that pollen will actually find one of those receptive female flowers uh, is greatly increased. And then finally, energy allocation. Uh, there's never enough energy to go around. And by the way, if you wonder whether oaks can have a good fall color, they can. That's a scarlet oak in my front yard. Never enough energy to go around. Uh, so oaks partition it. They either spend a lot of, of energy growing and make very few acorns, or they make a lot of acorns and spend very little energy growing. So again, those four hypotheses are not mutually exclusive. They all could be contributing to the evolution of oak masting. December is when you might recognize another unusual trait of, of oaks, and that is uh, they don't drop their leaves in the wintertime. And that's especially true of the uh, the uh, white oak group, and it's especially true of younger trees in the white oak group. Uh, that's a condition called marcescence. Uh, and uh, again, it's unusual. Why? You've got a deciduous tree, but it's not dropping its leaves. Most trees do drop their leaves, so why marcescence? A couple of hypotheses again, but this is the, the primary one. And that is that it wasn't long ago, eight, 9,000 years ago, when uh, there were a lot of big Pleistocene mammals out there. This is the group of mammals that was in Mexico alone. There were three species of mammoth. The giant uh, sloth here could reach up 18 feet. You know, the world, I think, had 44 species of rhinoceros back then. Um, so big guys, and many of them were browsers, like the white-tailed deer. White-tailed deer is not out in your, in your front yard eating grass. It's eating woody material, particularly in the wintertime. And they focus on buds, on the nutritionist, nutritional nutritious buds that will produce the foliage next year. So if oaks surround those buds with the dead leaves of the previous year, you can't get at them without getting a mouthful of dead leaves and it makes it untasty. And if you look at the distribution of marcescent leaves, they go up about 18 feet. And then the top of the tree is not marcescent. That's, that's because the mammals could not reach up there, or at least that's the story we tell. Impossible to test it these days, but it does make a nice story. And it also gives you, Marcescence gives uh, oaks uh, a very handy landscape trait, and that is you can use them as screens. So if you don't like your neighbor, you can plant a white oak and you can screen them out all seasons. It's great. January, it's cold. We're usually not out staring up in our oaks, but if we do uh, stare in our oaks, we might notice a lot of bird activity, particularly tiny little birds, things like our, our uh, chickadees and our, our tit mice. Um, even even uh, golden crown kinglets. I took this picture in my uh, yard when it was snowing. Um, they're up there flitting around the trees. Now, chickadees and, and titmice, of course, are at our feeders all winter long eating seed, and we think that's that's all they need. But it only only 50% of their diet is seed in the wintertime. The other 50% is insects and spiders. Uh, so maybe they're up in the tree eating insects and spiders, but you know, I'm an entomologist. We entomologists know there's no insects and spiders in the trees in the wintertime. And of course, the golden crown kinglet doesn't eat seeds at all. It's an insectivore. It should have migrated to where there were a lot of insects, but it doesn't. And that creates the kinglet paradox. What do we have a little bird that is going to have to eat insects all day long, all winter long, staying in the north where there aren't any insects? Well, Bernheidrich doesn't like uh, paradoxes. Uh, he, he, uh, he's a great naturalist. He's a retired entomologist. 
Uh, but he also writes a natural history uh, column in the magazine Natural History every month. Uh, and and uh, yeah, he doesn't like paradoxes. So he, looks, he looked in the crops of golden crown kinglets in Maine in January, and he found they were full of caterpillars in Maine in January. So they, there are caterpillars up there in the trees, and we didn't know it because they look like sticks. Uh, and when it gets cold, there's one there. Uh, they've got uh, antifreeze proteins in their cells that keep those cells from bursting. So they shrink a little bit, and then when it gets a little bit warmer, they swell a little bit, but they're just sitting there. There really is nothing for those caterpillars to eat all winter long. They're just sitting there. Um, so we don't have a kinglet paradox anymore. Uh, they are staying in the north, eating the caterpillars that are still in our trees, particularly our oak trees. But we do now have the question of what are the caterpillars doing up there? Most insects overwinter as eggs. Uh, it's easy to get through the winter as an egg or as a chrysalis or a pupa. Fewer insects overwinter as adults, um, but, but even fewer insects overwinter as, as larvae. And these are almost full-grown larvae. So why? Well, again, we don't know, uh, so we guess. I can, I can make good guesses. Uh, and what I think is going on is that, of course, in the spring, those buds uh, burst and we have a lot of new foliage. If you overwinter as an egg, you come out as a very tiny little larva, which can't compete with those big caterpillars. Um, if you overwinter as an adult, You've got to find a mate, you've got to uh, mate and then lay eggs, and then the eggs have to hatch. Um, same thing with the chrysalis, you've got to emerge as an adult and then find a mate. And, uh, so the, the larvae that overwinter, as nearly full-grown larvae, have a competitive advantage over everything else, and they essentially have unlimited amount of food early in the spring where they can complete their development and then turn into adults. February is the quietest time of year for oaks. So it's a good time to talk about what I call oak myths, oak landscaping myths. Of course, myths often are built on, you know, there's some degree of fact associated with a myth, or at least there used to be. Um, guys, that's a joke. <laughs> but um, I hear all the time, oaks are too expensive to use. So we can't, we can't use oaks. They grow too slowly. I hear people say, you know, if I plant an oak, I won't live long enough to enjoy it. They're too big to use on small lots, and if we do use them, they're gonna fall over and crush our house or they're gonna lift up the, the hardscape. Um, so these are all excuses that I hear people uh, offer for not using oaks in our landscapes. Um, so fact or fiction, let's look at each one of them. Are oaks too expensive to use? They can be for a lot of people if you insist on instant gratification, if you insist on planting a large oak, and a lot of people wanna plant large trees. So you can, you can easily spend $3,000 on a tree uh, and in order to move a tree that big, you've got to chop off most of its roots uh, and, and wish it luck. Well, nursery, nurserymen have figured out we like large trees, so they've, they've actually learned how to grow large trees in flower pots. Uh, and they do the best they can to avoid root binding. That's what a root bound tree looks like, where the roots go around and around the pot. Uh, and if you plant a tree like that, they'll continue to grow around and around, and eventually strangle the tree, and it won't live very long. But uh, these are called air pots, and they're pretty good at growing larger trees without root binding. But it's still a very small amount of root mass compared to the size of the tree that's in that pot. So when you plant it, the first thing it's gonna do is sit there and try to rebuild the root system that it needs to support a tree that big. Uh, and that can lead to a lot of mortality. There was a, uh, an oak planting in Newark, Delaware a couple summers ago that I passed. I think it was about 10 trees. Every single one died. That's too expensive to, to do. And it's because, you know, I'm sure if they had planted smaller trees, that wouldn't have happened. The other option, of course, is to have a bald or burlap tree where you really do chop off the roots, wrap it up in burlap and make it look nice, but it's very hard on, on the trees. Now, here's the point. If you plant an acorn the same day you plant one of these bald or burlap trees or, or uh, one of the uh, air pot trees, in 10 years, they're gonna sit there for 10 years trying to rebuild their root system if they don't die. But in 10 years, this acorn you plant will be, it'll be a big tree. <laughs> it'll easily be bigger. That's the angel oak down in uh, South Carolina or somewhere. Um, no, really, in 10 years, it will be bigger and healthier than that tree that you spent a lot of money on. Um, I've done this at my house. I wasn't planning to do it, but uh, it, I, I did it inadvertently, um, and it really does, does work. 
Uh, of course, there's a, a reason that nurserymen don't want to sell oaks this big because they can't charge you very much. So I'm not trying to, to uh, squash the large oak industry. There, there are reasons on street trees and some other places where you really want, do want to start with a larger oak, but I'd love to include this as an option for people who don't want to spend thousands of dollars on an oak. This is a great size to plant your oak and it will grow faster and be healthier in the long run. But if we do plant small, let's, that brings us to the next question. Do oaks grow too slowly? Well, let's have a race here between, uh, this is the oak we're following in my, my yard and my little friend Bella here. People think she's my daughter, but she's not. Uh, she's not even my granddaughter, but she was our surrogate granddaughter until we found real ones. <laughs> and she's two years old here. She was born on my wife's birthday and Bella spent a lot of time at, at our house. Uh, but she loved this oak tree. When she was an infant, she'd go out and grab the leaves and stop crying. Um, so I decided, let's have a race between Bella and the oak. Now, this is a white oak. You know it's going to grow really slowly because you know how slowly white oaks grow. Um, so, and it's six years old right here. But uh, let's have a race. There it is at six years old. The oak is seven years old here. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Bella's losing. <laughs> Thirteen, fourteen. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. 2020, Bella's got her mask on, so we know it's 2020. Um, and Bella's only 16 here, but she did the best she can. She's 5'11", uh, but the tree easily beat her. So this is, this is a myth I'm going to throw out. Oaks do not grow too slowly. After you get through that first few years where they are a little bit slow, then they grow as fast as any other tree. And here's a really important point. They start to contribute ecologically to your, the food web uh, at your, in your yard. And we're always trying to rebuild those food webs. They do that the very first year. This is a pin oak that's just popped its head above the leaves. And that's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that tree. You don't have to wait decades or hundreds of years for your oaks to start to, to support the life in your yard. Our oaks too large to use in small lots. You're not going to find a landscape architect or a landscape designer to uh, spec a large tree like this. These are red oaks in a lot that size. Nobody's going to suggest that. And if you move down the street a little bit, there are pin oaks that are just that big. This is, uh, I passed this on the way to uh, University of Delaware when I go to work, which is rarely these days. Um, so it happens. Now, those trees were probably planted when those houses were built, which is probably more than 100 years ago. And remember, 100 years ago, there was no air conditioning. So those trees provided a valuable ecosystem service. They, they uh, shaded the, the house, dropped the temperature of that house at least 10 degrees. They have not lifted up the, the sidewalk or the street, and they haven't fallen over and crushed the house. But again, nobody's going to recommend that. This is a large oak in front of a large church. Fortunately, they didn't chop it down when they built the church. Uh, but again, it's an exception. This is a large Gary, Gary Oak, uh, Oregon white oak. Uh, in Portland, Oregon, and they didn't chop that down either, but an exception. Point is, we do have some small oaks that uh, we, we need to get more into the, uh, into the trade. Uh, in the east, the dwarf chestnut oak, Quercus prinoides, is, is the best bet, particularly for this area. Uh, it, it will produce acorns when it's five feet tall, or at least it did in my, in my yard. Georgia oak, it's a, it's a very rare species, but it's been in the trade in the past. This is a dwarf live oak. It's Quercus virginianum, the big, the big southern live oak, the live oak that has the Spanish moth flying, uh, hanging from it. But it's a dwarf uh, uh, subspecies um, that's available. Chapman oak, we need to be, uh, get these uh, a lot more common in, in the trade. These are all the oaks that are uh, available in the yellow highlighted ones are the ones that are in Texas alone. There are more species available in the West. Um, so we do have small oak options uh, that I wish, I wish the uh, trade would start to support. It is, that's the dwarf chestnut oak in my yard there, the acorns. I'm looking down on it and I'm pretty tall. But. Here's another option I wish people would, would uh, consider and that is coppicing. Let your oak get uh, maybe two or three inches in diameter and then cut it off at the base and it'll come back as a bush. You see this uh, around uh, beaver dams where the beavers have done that, uh, but it allows you to have valuable oak foliage in your yard without having the big tree that supports that foliage. Uh, and it, it will stay a bush uh, for several years and then a leader will finally take over 
cut off the leader again, and you can coppice it for 100 years, no problem at all. So it gives you the option of having a small oak in a small yard um, if you so desire. But if we have oaks in our yards, they're going to fall over and crush our houses. They can. And of course, if it happens, you're going to hear about it on the news. There's a rule with the news. They're only going to report bad news. They are, they are forced to do that. You're never going to hear about the oak that did not fall over <laughs> and crush your house. And it's not just oaks that are falling over. Uh, we're having highly variable weather. We get a lot of rain and a lot of wind, and over they go. Uh, and one of the main reasons that's happening is because we insist on planting every single tree as a specimen tree. We isolate it. Uh, from any other tree, so it's not competing for light, it's not competing for, for uh, water or nutrients, so that it can, it can attain its full, you know, majestic size. That's what we're going for anyway. But then that tree does not have the option of interlocking its roots with any other tree, so you get that wet, wind, windy period, and over they go. This is the way trees grow in the forest. They do interlock their roots into a very stable matrix, this is a uh, stream cut near my house where the water has washed away the roots. There are four trees here, one, two, three, four, and look at how those roots are locked in together. They don't blow over. They might snap over, snap off if you get a, a tornado or a really uh, hard straight line wind, but they won't blow over. So we're thinking about uh, changing this, uh, this, this strategy into this. Now these are the two white oaks down the street that we got our original uh, acorns from. Nobody planted them. They planted themselves. That's three feet apart there. Uh, and, and they were planted, of course, before the, the road came in, but they haven't fallen over. Neither one is as uh, majestic as it would be if it were alone, but it, they're creating a stable little oak grove. This is, uh, these are three red oaks in uh, northwestern Connecticut called the Three Sisters. You go in the forest and you look around, you see this all the time. So it's very natural for, for trees to, to clump and they become very stable. Um, so oak groves, think about oak groves. They don't all have to be the same species. This is actually a planned planting uh, at Mount Cuba Center in Hokesson, Delaware. It's one of the DuPont estates and it's dedicated to native plants. That's a large red oak in the back. These are hemlocks in the front. These are large roadies uh, in, down on the, on the ground here and hardscape. But it is a, a plan planting, but you wouldn't know it. It looks very natural. Uh, all of those roots are inter interlocked. They're very stable. They're not going to blow over. So if you have four or five acres of lawn and you're wondering how I'm going to reduce it, make a little, a little tree grove. It'll be stable. It'll be beautiful. We're going to view it as a unit instead of as individuals. It'll provide a lot of habitat, and it won't blow over. Are our oaks going to lift up our hardscape? Uh, it depends on what we plant them over. So if you plant your oak over bedrock, the only place the roots can go is laterally. And yes, it'll lift up the hardscape. But this is a, a pin oak, uh, which is not having any, any, causing any problems here with the, the road. These are two uh, big red oaks at the University of Delaware. That's a big tree right next to the curb, no problem at all, because they've got the space. The other option, the other thing that uh, might cause your oak to lift up hardscape is if you plant it over agricultural pan. So if you know your, your house is over uh, what used to be ag fields where the plow went down for 100 years, 200 years, about 15 inches or 18 inches, the, the soil beneath where the plow went gets very, very compacted. That's called pan, and the roots will go down and hit that and then go laterally. So if you know you're over agricultural pan, you've got to break it up, break it up with a pickaxe or a ripper behind a, a tractor, and then you won't have that problem. All right, March. It's where we get to talk about leaf litter um, because those leaves, the marcescent leaves are finally dropping and they're gonna start to perform their role on the ground. First of all, there's a lot of variation in oak leaves. A lot of people think all oaks have lobe leaves. They're either pointed or they're, they're rounded, but there are a number of species without any lobes at all. This is a uh, Southern live oak uh, leaf. This is a, a emery oak in, in uh, Arizona. Looks like a holly leaf. This is a willow oak. That's a, a water oak. Um, shingle oak. So not all oaks have, have lobes. So a lot of variation in oak leaf size and shape, and they make a lot of leaves. If you take all the leaves from a large oak and you line them up on a tennis court, it's going to cover four tennis courts. And that's their job, to cover the ground, to provide a, a blanket. Uh, provide, uh, what it's doing is maintaining the moisture level in the soil. Our soil community is extremely 
important. It's a, an essential component of our ecosystems. We don't seem to care about it because it's very hard to study and we can't see it. But there are a lot of things living down there that are turning over the nutrients that are in these leaves. So not only are the leaves providing a blanket, keeping the moisture level high, because all of those species require high uh, humidity. Um, they're protecting the soil from uh, the sun baking, you know, the sun that would bake it from any wind erosion or water erosion. And they're also uh, feeding the detritivores that are in the soil. Detritivores are turning over detritus, that's uh, dead plant material, and returning the nutrients to the soil so the plant can use it again. All the nutrients that your tree used the previous year are tied up in those leaves. And if we rake them all away, we've just taken away all the leaves that tree needed that year. And if we do that for 50 years, you're starving your, your oak tree. Uh, so there are more species that live underground than above ground, and we need to protect them. And that includes the mycorrhizae that are transferring uh, nutrients to our, our uh, tree roots. People worry that if you leave your, your leaves on the ground or if you leave them in your flower beds, your plants won't be able to get through those leaves. They're very good at getting through those leaves. This is a little fern grove. Uh, nobody planted it, um, and that's a normal layer of, of oak leaves. That's a, a white oak over there. Um, so they're very good at getting through those, those leaves. This, these are um, wood poppies at my house. I'm never home. I never get to rake my leaves, and they come through just fine. Um, native pachysandra, a lot of things are going to do well in leaf litter. This is a Virginia creeper. So um, if you don't pile it five feet high, your plants will get through just fine. A lot of things living in that leaf litter, 250,000 mites per square meter, 100,000 springtails. These are little Columbulin uh, springtails. That's a sminthorid. 20, uh, 90,000 proturans. Those are primitive insects, little white things. You need a microscope to see them well. A million nematodes. So it's teeming with life when you have that high, uh, high humidity. And things that we can see easily, like the uh, banded hair streak, beautiful butterfly. But its caterpillar eats dead oak leaves, only if we don't rake them away. If we rake them away, we've lost a banded, banded hair streak. We've lost 70 species of what we call litter moths. These are, these are moths that actually develop on dead leaves on the ground. Who knew? Things like the ambiguous litter moth, the American idea, the dark spotted palpus. When the, the white-throated sparrows and the towhees and the other things that are, that are searching for insects in the leaves are doing their little dance, you know, they're kicking the leaves back with their, their uh, legs. What they're doing is looking for the larvae and the adults of, of these guys. And they will be there. They'll feed them all winter long as long as we don't rake all of our leaves away. And then, of course, you have the predators that are searching out all of those things to eat them. A number of species of ground beetles, um, lightning bugs. That's where, that's where lightning bugs live. You know, lightning bugs are not bugs, they're not fireflies, they're not flies, they are beetles. That's what an adult looks like. That's the lantern that they use to, uh, the sexes communicate with each other with that lantern. But this is what the larva looks like. It is a predator in leaf litter. And if you rake away the leaf litter, you don't have any lightning bugs. So I hear all the time, how come I don't have lightning bugs anymore? Well, you can't rake away their habitat. You can't use chemlon and poison them. Um, you can't have your lights on all the time and mess up their communication. Uh, so if you have lightning bugs, you're doing a number of things right, and one of them has got to be keeping that leaf litter around. April is when uh, you get the, the first bud break. The new season really starts to, to happen, and it's a chance for you to see one of the most ephemeral things that occurs in all of nature. It takes about five minutes. Now, it happens a lot during that five minutes. But if you're out there at the right time, you can, you can witness it. And I'm talking about when cynipid gall wasps lay their eggs in the buds of your oak tree. And that's what's happening here. This is a cynipid gall wasp female, female. That structure right there is her ovipositor. She's injecting an egg into the bud. This is a male who is riding her. He's already mated with her, uh, but he's riding her because after she lays the egg that he fathered into that bud, she's gonna to go to another bud and lay another egg, and he wants to make sure he's the father of that egg as well. And this is a male who wishes he was that male. <laughs> so here she is injecting an egg into the bud, and not only is she injecting an egg, she's injecting plant hormones that will direct the growth of the cells around that egg. Uh, and the oak has plant hormones too, and it is trying to direct the, the growth of these cells. These are meristematic, undifferentiated cells, essentially like stem cells. They can go in any direction. And I hear people say that, that uh, 
galls, and that's what results from uh, a, a gall wasp overposition, are like cancerous growth. I don't like that analogy because cancerous growth is uncontrolled growth. That's why cancer causes so much trouble. Galls are highly controlled growth. It's a, it's a compromise between what the oak wants and what the sinipid wants. And that compromise is species specific. So we can identify what species of galler made the gall just by looking at the shape of the gall. There are a lot of uh, sinipid gallers out there. A thousand species are associated with oaks. A single oak tree can support up to 70 species of gallers. It's almost impossible to find an oak tree that does not have galls on it. Many of these galls are hollow. This is the apple oak gall or the oak apple gall. I've seen it written both ways. And if you cut it open, you've got a central disc here and it's inside that disc that the gall larva is actually living. And then you've got a big space, big air space here and then the outside of, of the gall. What is that all about? Well, sinipid gallers have more natural enemies, more parasitoids. A parasitoid is, is, a, is a parasite that kills its host whereas a true parasite doesn't kill its host. So these guys, these guys kill sinipid uh, gallers. That's a terimid wasp and it has a very long ovipositor. The object is to pierce the gall and lay an egg in that, that galler. So the gall has to be constructed in a way that separates the galler uh, from the outside of the gall by the length of this ovipositor. So if the galler's here and the outside of this gall is here, um, it's vulnerable. When the galls are small, the sinipid gall, the, the terimid gallers can actually reach the galler and, and they hit them very hard. But these galls grow very quickly, separating the gall uh, larva from its natural enemies, uh, and then it's safe the rest of the time. This is a terimid in California that has the longest ovipositor and it has resulted in the largest gall in the country. Uh, this one is, it's on uh, the uh, Oregon white, white oak. So the distance again from the center of the gall to the outside has to be bigger than the ovipositor of that, that terimid. A lot of variation in, in galls um, and some of them are quite pretty. Many of them are just are, are circles on leaves or spherical things on branches. Some look like candy, some look like that, some look like diseases. A number of them look like plant diseases but they're really gallers in there. This is a spindle gall from uh, California. California has the most uh, variety of, of galls more candy. This is one uh, in my yard, looks like a little, little bit of pottery. This is the cutest one, the gnome house gall. <laughs> so that's where the galler has emerged, but it does look like the gnome lives there. A brain gall. This is an interesting one. You've got four galls on a single leaf. Uh, and in this case, a number of gall wasps develop in single galls. So the, the female laid a bunch of eggs and here they are. Those are the emergence holes. So the adults have already left. But that one leaf produced, what, a couple hundred uh, galls, gallers. And galls have, have played a very interesting role in our recorded human, or our recorded history. We're, we're the humans. If you grind up a gall like this and combine it with particular chemicals, it makes an indelible black ink. And that is the ink that our history has been recorded with. The Bible was written with gall ink. The Magna Carta was written with gall ink. Declaration of Independence was written with gall ink. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci wrote with gall ink and all of the monks and scribes in the Middle Ages, all gall ink. So you can share that at your next cocktail party. <laughs> okay, May, the leaves are, are fully expanding here uh, and, and the, the new biological season really takes off. And along with the expansion of leaves, not just oak leaves, but all the leaves in, in the temperate zone, comes the caterpillars that eat those leaves. And following the caterpillars that eat those leaves, of course, are the birds that eat those caterpillars. It is no coincidence that migration is timed with the expansion of leaves in the temperate zone. Remember, migrants uh, in the spring, they're not eating seeds and berries. The, the plants haven't made them yet. They'll do some of that on the, the fall trip, but they're depending on insects, primarily caterpillars. And birders, you birders know that if you're gonna look for, for warblers in the spring, you go to oak trees because that's where most of them are. I had a student, Christy Beal, I'm sorry, this is not translating well either, um, several years ago who measured the amount of time that warblers spend foraging in different plant families in big trees in um, cemeteries. So these are plant families here. The first family here is the Phagaceae. And look, they're spending a lot more time in Phagaceae is the oaks, the chestnuts, and the beeches. There were no beeches and chestnuts in her sample size, so this is all oaks. 
Um, these, are, these are pines, uh, birches. So it trails off very quickly. Most of the caterpillar food that's driving migration uh, is built by our oaks. So that's why the birds are there. They're not going to forage in a tree that doesn't have much to eat. So things like the purple crested slug, the buck moth, the white marked tussock moth, the saddle prominent, double line prominent, white dotted prominent, the checkered fringe prominent, the lapper, the lace cap caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the skiff moth, the uh, white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the banded tussock moth, the red line panapoda, the yellow neck caterpillar, the smaller parasa. The unicorn caterpillar, the crown slug, these guys are called slug caterpillars because their head is tucked up underneath, not because they're really slugs. The streak dagger moth, the epilated dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the red humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the confused wood grain, the spiny oak slug, and my favorite, the spun glass slug, and literally hundreds more species of caterpillars are associated with oaks, and that's why the birds are there. Now, We should definitely clap for oaks because they're, they're the best. So this is my house, uh, what it looked like from the same place I took, took that first picture. Uh, and it's just to show you, we put a lot of plants back. We're still putting plants back. But over the years, my research has shown if you count the number of moss species that are making a living in, in your, your little space, um, you, can, you can get a very good feel for the stability of the food web that you've created and the productivity of the food web. And that's what I've been doing for the last five years, taking a picture of every single moss species that I could find. And I'm up to 1,199 species of moss in my yard. And that's happened in the last 20 years. 28% use oaks. Now, the percentage of oaks in terms of diversity in my, my yard, of woody plants only, is only 1.5%. So it shows the oak trees are really important in terms of creating the biodiversity in your yard. And because so many of those caterpillars that oaks are supporting uh, our types of bird food, we've recorded 60 species of birds that have bred in our 10 acres, not flew by, but bred. And that's why I call oaks keystone species. Remember what a keystone is? It's a stone in the middle of the Roman arch. If you take that stone out of the arch, the arch falls down. Well, if you take keystone uh, species out of your local food web, the food web collapses because they are making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. And oaks are the best at, at, uh, in, in terms of making that caterpillar food. They are the top keystone plant in 84% of the counties in which they occur. They support more than 950 species of caterpillars nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that. Why do we keep talking about caterpillars? Who cares about caterpillars? Well, the birds eat caterpillars. They are transferring more energy from plants to other animals, particularly birds, than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars in them, they're failed food webs and uh, eventually failed ecosystems. And it's not just the migrants that need those caterpillars. Our overwintering birds, even the seed eaters during the winter time, are, are um, rearing their young on insects. 96% of our terrestrial birds rear their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. A lot of data on chickadees. This is a Carolina chickadee. It takes 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get one nest of a chickadee to the point where it fledges, where those, those babies uh, leave the nest. And that depends on the number of chicks in the nest. And after they fledge, uh, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days, but they're flying all around and nobody's been able to, to count them. Um, so it takes a lot of caterpillars and oaks are good at providing all of those caterpillars. Whereas our non-native plants are not. Your crepe myrtle, no caterpillars. Your ginkgo, no caterpillars. Gotta have the oaks. All right, June. Now this past year, June was cicada month. We had a, an emergence of the periodical cicada and I know that you didn't. So we'll just share briefly uh, how neat it was. Um, we had the 17 year brood uh, of cicadas come out. And of course it's very predictable. We know this is gonna happen. And if we know it's gonna happen, the media knows it's gonna happen. And they had a lot of fun being as negative as they possibly could. It was gonna be an invasion. You might consider moving before it happens. Um, they're gonna sing so loud that you're gonna go crazy and kill your babies. These are things I heard, and they were saying them with straight faces too. A terrible scourge, we should all fear it. Everything I heard about this, this coming cicada emergence was negative. And of course it was none of those things. It was uh, 
as Mike Raup at the University of Maryland calls it, it's, it's the entomologist Super Bowl. We wait for this. <laughs> one of the most fantastic biological events you'll ever be privileged to witness. And it was a good one this year. This was in front of one oak tree in front of the, my building at the University of Delaware. Those are shed skins, it's called exuviae. And of course, once they crawl out of the ground, they have been uh, developing on uh, plant roots, and they really do like oaks for 17 years, but all, of, all at the same time, they crawl out, they leave holes, they have aerated your soil. So when it rains, uh, the water gets down to the roots and you get oxygen to the roots. You don't have to pay anybody to do this. Uh, but there were a lot. There were so many that 11 Mississippi kites flew to Newark, Delaware to eat our, our uh, cicadas. And they stayed for two weeks. And then they flew away. Who knows where they came from? So this is the, the typical life cycle. They crawl out at night, very vulnerable stage, uh, and then they're going to molt. They split their skin. The uh, tenoral adult uh, hangs down, then it swings up, and, and what it's going to do is, is tan its skin. It's going to harden up its, its exoskeleton. Um, so it's like a soft-shelled crab now. It's very vulnerable, so it's, that's why they do it at night, so nothing can find them. Uh, and then they'll hang there for a couple of hours, and, and then they are very, very they're ready to go. They're full adults. Their, their exoskeleton is all, all tanned up. And they fly off and start their life cycle. And their life cycle means the male is going to try attract a female by singing. And his singing uh, is really vibrating two membranes in his thorax. They're called tympana, just like the little membranes in our ears. Uh, and what they do is they click them back and forth, like a Coke can, click, 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 click. But they do it about 400 times a second. So it, it forms a buzz. Uh, and these guys want to buzz as loud as they can because females judge male quality on how loud they buzz. Because only a, a healthy male can, can, loud very, can buzz loudly. So this guy was successful. He attracted a female. They made it, and then it's her turn. What she's going to do is lay her eggs in the stems of trees, primarily oaks. That's her ovipositor. She's jamming it into the stem of a pin oak in my front yard. Take a pin one day and try to jam it into the stem of a pin oak or any other oak. You're going to bend the pin. It's really hard. But she's good at it. She can get it in there. There she's got it worked up in there. She's going to lay an egg, one egg, two egg, three eggs, right down in a, in a row, seven or eight eggs. And then she'll go to another stem and do the same thing. And from the point where they lay their eggs, the branch often dies. The branches of my pin oak didn't die. They laid all over it. None of them die, which is unusual. But typically, they die, and that's called uh, flagging. Uh, and people get upset. The cicadas are going to kill our trees. It's terrible. They're not going to kill your trees. They're going to prune them once every 17 years. And your trees can take that, believe me. Then the eggs hatch. The little guys fall to the ground. I used to say they parachute to the ground. And somebody said, how do they parachute? They don't really have parachutes. They just fall to the ground. And they dig down. Uh, and what they do is attach themselves to a, a root. And they will stay there for 17 years sucking xylem. The xylem is essentially water. There's almost no nutrients in it, which means a tree can have up to 50,000 nymphs on its root system with no measurable impact on the tree at all, as long as you don't have, have a drought. Um, and we never seem to have droughts We're down where I am. So where do they overposit? I had a, oh, this is all messed up too, but I had a, a student measure uh, the amount of flagging on different tree species in Newark, Delaware. The green bars are species of oaks. So, uh, boy, they even rearranged that. They liked oaks more than anything else. Just trust me on this. <laughs> and then they die. Uh, so it takes about three weeks. That's it for the next 17 years. And of course, the big question is, why do they spend 17 years underground? Uh, and it's probably the same predator satiation explanation. A lot of things eat cicadas. Those Mississippi kites and squirrels and many, many birds are eating cic cicadas. Um, but a predator cannot specialize on these cicadas and eat once every 17 years. So the population of the things that eat cicadas are always much smaller than the millions of cicadas that, that come out. Predator satiation. July. This is when the night chorus begins. And by night chorus, I'm talking about katydids, male katydids that are singing. Uh, this is the male katydid. What they do is they raise their wings up, and they rub this sclerotized portion of the ring back and forth like this. And there's a scraper and a file on, on those wings, and it makes a typical katydid sound. And you might wonder why they're making that sound. This is why. 
Once upon a time, uh, there was a young woman named Katie who fell in love with a handsome young man. Alas, he did not share her feelings and he married another. Soon thereafter, he and his young bride were found poisoned in their bed. Who perpetrated the crime was never determined, but some say the insects in the trees were watching that night, and each summer they solved the mystery by singing, Katie did, Katie did. <laughs> and now you should be hearing the Katie did sounds, but since this is up in the booth, you're not hearing it. Who's never heard of Katie did? You've heard of Katie did. I used to do a lot of camping in North, North Jersey, and they sang me to sleep uh, a lot. It's, it's a great sound. Uh, there are four species of katydids that frequent our, our oak forests in the east. There's only one species in, in the west. This is what a female looks like before she's expanded her wings. She's just about an adult. She's got her ovipositor all ready to go. Uh, and of course, she is going to seek out the males that are singing the loudest for the same reason that the cicadas do. Uh, the male who's singing the loudest is the healthiest male. Then she will lay her eggs. She glues them to stems. They're very large eggs, and people find them, wonder what they are. These guys have already hatched. Those are Katie did eggs. They'll start singing around mid-July, sing all the way through July, through August, into early September, and then it depends on how, how quickly it gets cold in the fall when they stop. Okay, speaking of August, um, this is the time that oak leaves are at their toughest. In the spring, of course, they're pliable and tender. A lot of things can eat oak leaves, uh, full of nutrition. But by mid-August, they're, they're kind of like boards. Um, they're full of tannins, full of lignans, very tough. Uh, so it's hard for insects to eat them. They need specialized strategies to do that. And a very common strategy is to be gregarious. You're all eating together. This is the yellow net caterpillar that always feeds gregariously. Here it is when it's a young larva. Here it is when it's just about mature. But they're still feeding gregariously. And they can go through a lot of, of leaf litter or leaves pretty quickly. Common strategy, the uh, orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, they're all feeding gregariously. But people see this and they get upset. All these worms are eating my oak. I walked around the oak that we're, we're following here. This was 2014 and I counted the number of caterpillars just on the lower branches here on July 25th of 2014 and I got 410 of them. 115 were yellow neck caterpillars eating quite a bit of leaf material. And then I stood back and took that picture so I could ask you, do you see any of those caterpillars? Do you see any caterpillar damage? No, but this is the distance at which we view our trees. But if I knocked on your door and said, hey, you got 410 caterpillars on your oak tree, most people would say, get the spray can, call the man, save the tree. You don't have to save the tree. Oaks and most trees are very good at passing on part of the energy they capture from the sun, turn into food, and that's why you have other living things in your yard. If they didn't pass it on, if you go out and look at your leaves on, on all your plants and there's nothing eaten out of them, you've got a, a, a non-functional food web, essentially a dead ecosystem. I met a, a woman, Tammany Baumgarten, in New Orleans several years ago, and she suggested we all practice the 10-step program, take 10 steps back from your trees and all your insect problems disappear. And it's really, it's really good advice. Another strategy is to become a leaf miner. You get really small and you can actually uh, eat the material in between the tough uh, outer and, and inner uh, epidermis. That's where the, uh, all the toughness is in. But the palisade and mesophyll, the parenchymal cells are, are very tender and that's where the nutrition is. But you have to be small and thin to do that. Um, many of them are caterpillars. So this is a, a caterpillar uh, that made a serpentine leaf mine. The egg was laid here. It looks like a snake, that's why it's called a serpentine. And he eats along there and grows, and the black line is, is its poops, it's crass. It pushes it all to the middle. Then it pupated here, and that's the total amount of leaf uh, material that it ate before it matured as an adult. This is a blotched leaf mine, and there's the caterpillar in there. He just goes around in a circle and makes a blotch. Here it is backlit, and there it is with a very nice picture by, picture by Salvador Vitanza. It doesn't look much like a caterpillar, uh, because it's got all the specialized adaptations for leaf mining. But when it comes out as an adult, it looks just like a moth. They're tiny, uh, but there are a number of species. This is one of the Camomaria species, solitary oak leaf miner, the gregarious oak leaf miner, the oak tentiform leaf miner, many things mining leaves in August on oaks. Okay, September. This is our last month, and September, of course, is when you first start hearing those, those crickets. You know, if, a, if the black guy's on the ground, if a cricket gets in your house and sings, it's good luck, so don't step on it. 
but there are crickets that are up on vegetation. They're called tree and bush crickets. Uh, they're not black, they're usually yellowish or greenish. Uh, and there are tr crickets, crickets on oak trees as well, doing the same thing that the cicadas and the katydids do. These are males that are trying to attract females by singing as loud as they can. But these guys have an interesting twist on it. They find a hole in a leaf, or they chew a hole in a leaf of the right size, and they stick their head through there, and they raise their wings up, and they sing back and forth. Now, most leaves have a slight parabolic shape to them, and this projects the sound farther and louder than if he were singing on a, on a flat surface. So in other words, he's sending the female a false message. He's saying, I'm, loud, I'm bigger than I really am. I'm louder than I, than I really am. If you can believe a male would send a female a false message. And the female comes and mates with them and you say, oh boy, he's really tricked her. But maybe not, because he could be the smartest male and that might be what, what counts. Uh, September is also a good time to see uh, walking sticks. Uh, they are, they're called walking sticks because they look like sticks and they walk. Thin little insects that uh, spend most of their time in the canopy, so you usually don't see them until the fall and they start to come down. This is the walking stick I found on the emery oak in, in uh, Arizona. Um, there's, this is the one that's common in the east here. I say common, you know, occasionally there are records of defoliation by walking sticks in West Virginia. I've never seen them nearly that common. You usually see one or two a year. But they have an interesting uh, approach to reproduction. The females will just walk along the canopy and drop eggs to the forest floor. And some of those eggs will hatch that year. Some will wait to the following year and a few wait to the, the uh, two years later. It's called bet hedging, um, where they're, they're just, uh, you know, they're, not going to pull all their eggs in one season, and they're going to spread them out in case it's a bad, a bad year. But there's uh, another interesting thing going on here. This is, of course, bloodroot, one of the spring ephemerals, and bloodroot makes pods, and they have seeds in the pods, and those pods open up and release those seeds. They're pretty little things, but they've got these white structures on them called eliosomes, and it turns out eliosomes are really tasty things for ants. Ants love eliosomes, so they come and they pick up the seed and they take it back to the nest so everybody can eat the eliosome. And they do, but the seed is really hard, so they can't eat that, so they throw the seed in their garbage dump, which is a specific place in an ant nest about an inch below the surface of the soil, and it's a perfect place for that seed to germinate. Well, it turns out that walking stick eggs appear to be mimicking this. They've got a white stripe here. Um, I bet there's some chemical mimicry going on here, but the ants are attracted to them. They pick them up, they take them to the nest. They can't eat them, so they throw them in the garbage dump, and it's a really safe place for those eggs to, uh, to develop and hatch. All right, we've made it through the year. Um, so let's, let's end the way we, we started, um, talking about the biodiversity crisis that's out there. We have two crises that we humans have created on planet Earth. We've got climate change, big problem, and we have the biodiversity crisis. And if we had no climate change, we would still have the biodiversity crisis because we are not sharing the earth with other living things. We talk about things disappearing. We've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. We've got global insect decline. Nothing's disappearing. We're killing them. We're killing our birds. We're killing our insects. We're killing the nature that runs the ecosystems that support us. And that's why we are now experiencing the, the sixth great extinction event that the earth has ever known. So it is a global crisis. The good news is, it's got a grassroots solution, one that we all, you and I, we all can address it and actually make a difference. There are four things that every landscape has to accomplish if we're going to reach a sustainable relationship with the nature that sustains us. One is we've got to, we've got to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. Every landscape has to do that. Uh, it's not gonna solve climate change, but it's gonna sure help. We've gotta manage the watershed. Every landscape has to manage the watershed that it's in. Uh, and of course, it's the plants that are doing that. Every landscape has to support a diverse community of pollinators, not because they pollinate a third of our crops. It's really about a twelfth of our crops. And I hear people say, oh, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. We need to do it everywhere because they're pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. Nothing to do with our, our crops. If we lost our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. And that, of course, is not an option. And the fourth thing every, every landscape has to do is support that complex food web. Have plants that are going to capture energy from the sun, turn it into food, and then pass it on. When you plant an oak, you are addressing each one of those four ecological goals 
better than if you planted almost anything else. You're gonna capture more carbon over the life of that oak. That's the big root system is gonna manage the watershed better than other plants. You're gonna support a more complex food web because of all the species that are associated with, with oaks. You're even gonna help pollinators even though oaks are wind pollinated. Watch those catkins in the spring. Native bees go there and they gather the pollen. Now they're not pollinators because they're not moving it to the female flower, but they are using it for their own uh, nutrition. So uh, apparently uh, oak pollen is much more important for pollinators than we ever knew. Okay, despite all these, these uh, very important landscape attributes, our oaks are in trouble these days. The forest used to be loaded with the giant oaks. They're gone at this point because we cut them down for their wood value or they were in the way of our crops. The percentage of oaks in the Eastern forest has been cut in half in the last hundred years for several reasons. We've suppressed fire, which uh, the oaks are really fire climax uh, community species. And that has, has led to competition with other trees. We've introduced a number of, of uh, problems for oaks, including the spongy moth, which used to be the gypsy moth, um, oak wilt, bacterial leaf scorch, sudden oak death syndrome. These are serious diseases that are clobbering the oaks in this country. Deer overabundance, underappreciated, but really a big problem. Every single baby oak that pops up where there's deer, the deer eats it, and that's the end of, of recruitment into that forest. Uh, and habitat fragmentation, we're separating our oaks to the point where the, the pollen can't reach um, another tree. And if it can't reach it, then it's not gonna produce a lot of acorns. And because of all those things, 98 of our 91 North American oak species are now threatened. One third of the global oaks are actually endangered. The Oregon white oak, I referred to that a couple times tonight, has lost 97% of its range because it grew primarily in the areas along the West Coast that are used for agriculture. There are 2,300 species that rely on oaks in Great Britain that are threatened because of the loss of oaks in Great Britain. So we humans live our lives out in a very instant of, of a brief instant of ecological time, and we can't return those ancient oaks in that brief period, but we can start the process. Uh, and um, if we do, the oaks that we plant today, the oaks that we plant in the spring, uh, will attain their, their um, keystone roles in our ecosystem so much faster than we think. It's gonna take them a long time to become giant trees, but they still can contribute a lot. That's an oak I planted as an acorn in my yard. So we wanna do it as soon as possible. Why, you know, we're all responsible for good earth stewardship, every one of us, because we all require it. Everybody depends on healthy ecosystems. So everybody has the responsibility of taking care of those ecosystems. And the best way to, to exercise that responsibility is to embrace the power of oaks. So for the sake of our turkeys, our chickadees, our woodpeckers, our warblers, our jays, our thrushes, our lightning bugs, our galls, our weevils, our orthopterans, our moths, us, for our own sake, plant an oak, plant a living community, plant the future. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, questions? Yes. Oh, I think they want to put a microphone oh, to you. Oh, sorry. Um, I live in Marblehead. It's a lot of granite. You know, it's... Give there's the a... Name. Huh? <laughs> yeah. But behind my house is five acres they're going to make into a, a, a bike path that's mostly a, the woods is invasive species. How much sun, if, if I go up there with like little acorns and plant them, do, do they need sun? Is this a dumb idea or um, will they grow? It's locusts, it's red maple, it's, I don't know what else is up there. Right. All right, so how much, if you plant an acorn, does it need full sun to, to grow quickly? To grow quickly, it does but it can sprout and grow slowly and it can sit there, you know, in a normal forest community, it would sit there until a light gap opens up. You could have an oak that's, that's one foot high that could be 30 years old, waiting for the, the light gap to open up. Problem today is a deer's gonna eat it way before that. So if you actually plant oaks out there, you gotta put a little cage around them. 
actually put a big cage around them because when they do germinate, mm. I see so often somebody will put a cage around and then not go and check it and the oak comes up and is bent <laughs> over because it, it needed more space. But that's the problem today with our deer overabundance and, and uh, the invasive species will also choke it out. So you have to manage it. We're gardening the world because of the problems we've created and that's okay. Go garden those, those oak trees. All, you know, 90% of the oaks I put on my property, I did as acorns, they're 60 feet tall now. I don't have to do anything to them. So a little bit of attention in the beginning, even my overabundance of deer can't hurt those oak trees now. So you can get past it and it is worth putting up there. You wanna increase the, the density of oaks in most of our forests because it's far less than it used to be. Although that piece of property you're trying to save, somebody said 50% were oaks. That's what it used to be. About 50% of our, our forests in the Northeast were, were oaks. So that's, that's a good piece of property. Thank you. Hey, so if you're harvesting acorns in the fall, what are you doing with them over winter um, before you plant them, presumably in the spring? Okay, good question. Remember the white oak group and the red oak group. Those are the two groups that we have right here. The white oak group germinates in the fall. So you either put it in a flower pot with dirt so that it can germinate and then spend the winter already germinated, or uh, you plant it where it's going to be and protect it. Um, most times when you do that, if you just put it in the ground, a, a rodent is going to get it over the winter time. So I would encourage you to put it in a pot and then watch the rodents too. The mice will crawl right in your pot and eat your, your egg corn. That's the biggest challenge. And then plant it once it puts up its, its leaves in the spring. The red oak group won't germinate till the spring, so you can get a Ziploc bag with some peat moss. And I say peat moss because they're acidic enough that it keeps uh, fungal growth down. Uh, a little bit of moisture, put your red oak egg corns in there and then put them in the refridge. And then take them out maybe March uh, and, and plant them. You can do it in a flower pot or straight in the ground and they'll, they'll germinate in the spring. So you have to treat the two groups differently. Hello. <clears throat> I have plant, I've replanted, sorry, I hope you can understand me. I replanted after an invasive Norway maple had to be taken down. I don't have a large yard. I live in East Gloucester. Um, and I was worried if I planted a tree that would grow big, I would have loved to plant an oak. But I thought after me, someone's going to be scared and take it, cut it down. So I planted a hot pawn beam. I was interested in your pollarding, which I can do. <clears throat> but you said light is a problem that moths won't come or they'll, oh. I can't remember if they die. I, do you know of any solution to um, street lamps? Yes, I do. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, one of the major causes of insect declines is the light pollution we have at night. Uh, but yellow wavelengths are not attractive, particularly to the moths that make the larvae that, that run our ecosystems. So take the white bulb out of your, your front porch or your garage light or your security light. Um, and we should do it for our street lights too, and put in yellow bulbs uh, because they are uh, not going to attract the moths and kill them. Um, Europe is starting to do this, but we need to do it all, all over the place. And if we, if we did it, we, we'd save millions of insects every single night. And they also come in LEDs. So if you'd use LEDs, you save millions of dollars too. But um, I actually have a student and he's working right up here in, in the Boston area who is measuring uh, moth populations from center cities out into rural areas to see what the impacts are, not of just the plants you have, but these other factors like the amount of, of uh, impervious surface that we have, the amount of lighting that we have, and they're highly correlated. Wherever you have impervious surface, you probably have, have lighting. Um, because I, you know, I'm going around saying everybody should plant oaks and other things and, and it'll be great. But if there's other things killing all these these insects, we need to know that, you know, how great will it really be? And nobody's measured it yet, except for my student. He's about ready to release his results. So. But make your lights yellow and you will help a lot. The city about what <clears throat> I will take the idea of the street light. So I have done it with my own. 
but I have such a small yard, the street light outside is, I've looked at it going, well, now what? But now I know I can. Good, go good luck, good luck with that. Hi, I have um, the fortune of living next to a state forest, mm -hmm. but there's been no fires for years, right? So the density of the pine trees is tremendous and it's a race for the light, but they're all scrawny little one inch diameter trees and then they flop over. Would you recommend thinning a forest on our little bit before it hits the state forest? Should we work on? Uh, yeah, so, so the oak pine barrens, that is a fire climax community, and occasionally fires go through and, and thin it out naturally, but we do suppress those fires, and that's what you're talking about. So yes, you can thin them uh, and create more of a, a natural situation. Fires return nutrients to the soil, so they're important that way, but within the absence of fire, you can still uh, mimic what a fire does, simulate what it does by thinning, uh, and, and um, you know, leave... Leave the best and take take the, the rest. That's yeah. what sustainable forestry is all about. And San Jose, California has yellow streetlights because they used to okay. have an observatory. And ah. as you're driving around, it's like yellow lights from stoplights everywhere, but that's their city wide. Okay, that's right. So, so the, the uh, Dark Nights Initiative, that's what it's called for to look stargazing. Okay. Um, they have the same problem. They yeah. want the lights, uh, they want the lights to go away. But not only yellow lights, but I forgot to mention, you can put, uh, get them to put covers on those lights. It directs the, the light straight down and keeps it from, from shining up. So I didn't know anybody's actually done that. That's great. San Jose? They did that for an observatory, which is now closed. So as the, old, the lights out all the yellow ones, as they die out, they're replacing them with really? the cheaper LEDs. But for a while, citywide, it was all yellow lights. Street lights. <laughs> Yellow LEDs are not more expensive than white LEDs. Yeah. <sighs> I have two questions about green acorns. Here in Salem, we have those showers, uh, and when the showers I've seen, they're all green, like just thousands of them. And that's one question. The other question is, do squirrels eat green acorns? A green acorn is not a mature acorn. It's an immature acorn. So squirrels want, want the, the final product. I don't know if a starving squirrel would, would eat it, but- uh, I think they don't. I would say no. And if you have green acorns on the ground, the tree has aborted it. Uh, and they'll do that for a number of reasons. So you've had some serious drought issues up here. They'll abort it for, for that reason. Um, many, most plants set more seed than they can developed and they have the energy to mature so they'll ab abort it depending on how much energy they have in their in their roots but i'll bet you're seeing a lot of green acorns on the ground because of your drought oh, okay i just returned from uh to the north shore from nine years in central illinois and we lived in a town there and we had three just stunningly large and beautiful oak trees adjacent to the property i came to revere them they were so you know they were impressive living creatures but i want to return to the question about leaves that don't drop during the winter or during the fall what was the word for that again marcescence marcescence and and uh the the, the examples that you showed it showed that they're at the bottom and then they thinned out higher up that was not true of these oaks they, they left a, a tatters of leaves a pretty evenly distributed throughout the whole tree, some 80, 90 feet high. Hmm. And it was damned untidy. I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was curious. I mean, uh, you said that that was a white oak. Somebody said that those were pin oaks. Could you just the, say a little bit more about root. what those were? Yeah, um, you know, all the oaks that do it to some extent. The red oak group, and that includes pin oaks, do it to a lesser extent. So I've got red oaks and pin oaks and white oaks and black oaks and all those guys on my property. Um, most of the red oak group by this time of the year have dropped all their leaves. My white oaks are still hanging on to most of their leaves. Right, so you see that. So 80 to 90 feet tall. You must have had some really big places seeing mammals out there. That's all I can say. So. <laughs> all right. So how about two more questions? Um, we'll pass here and then. Hi there. Um, I was just curious how uh, species specific are um, 
like for, for insects on uh, native oaks. And if we were planting oaks kind of outside of their native range, would we expect the same sort of ecosystem services locally? Okay, good question. Uh, an insect that is adapted to feeding on oaks uh, is pretty good at feeding on most of the oaks. We compared uh, 16 species of oaks for exactly that, that reason. Now there are 91 species of oaks, so we didn't, you know, we just scratched the surface, but um, very small differences between uh, those groups of oaks. The white oak group edged out the red oak group a little bit, but not much. The only oaks that underperformed, and even they had quite a bit of, of uh, they were hosting quite a few insects, were the oaks that were out of range. So we included willow oak and water oak, which uh, where we did the study, they're above their northern limit. Uh, which means they have left the insects that typically uh, eat them behind. Uh, we also looked at red oaks in Portland, Oregon, which are totally non-native. They're carried out there for, for uh, ornamental reasons and compare them to the red oaks back east where they belong. The red oaks in Portland supported nothing, absolutely nothing, and the red oaks back east are a great host plant. So when you really take them far away, uh, it's, it's just like a, a non-native species. You, it's, it's not, you know, it's the same plant. It's just that it is away from the community that typically uses it. And that's why I get the question all the time. Can I plant an English oak, Quercus robar? There's a fastigiate form, a really narrow one, uh, because people say, I don't have a lot of room, so I want to plant this oak. Will it support as many insects? No, it's from Europe. It'll support a few, but, but uh, not nearly as many. And that's not my fault. <laughs> So if you only have room for a couple of oaks, um, is it, should you plant, you know, like two pin oaks or can you plant a, a pin oak and a red oak or you know, can, does that make any sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And that's where this pollination issue comes in. Uh, because if you plant one oak of one species, most of the time it's going to make no acorns at all. Now oaks do hybridize within a group, uh, but, um, and they, you know, they do it quite often, but it's best to plant more than one individual of a species so that they can, they can fertilize each other. I have a shingle oak in my yard. Uh, it's, it's big at this point. It's the biggest oak that we have on the property uh, that I planted. And every year it makes thousands of acorns and aborts every single one because there's no other shingle oaks around. So it never gets, there's no pollen coming from another, another oak. So, you know, I have the shingle oak and, and its leaves support things, but I'm not making any acorns. So if, you, if I had the choice of one or two uh, species of plants, I would, I would focus on one so you can get those acorns. They're, they're an important part of the picture. Well, um, we're going to leave it at that. I know there's lots of other questions among all of us. Um, Doug is going to be out uh, available to sign some more books so you can ask him questions when he's out there want to thank you again for making the long journey out of your territory to come here. This was actually a pretty short journey. <laughs> Comparatively, right? Yeah. Um, thank you again. Yeah.